And we're preparing now to sing with the RPO, not only here in April, but in Carnegie Hall. And I know that uh, Reverend Hess would have been pleased to be a part of that. So in that light, um, we found out during that rehearsal that David wasn't going to be joining us and perhaps may not be joining us anymore. Um, Eastern Rochester course is uh, a course of 150 singers, both made up of Eastman students, the best in the world, and community singers. Uh, we were led by William Leinert, and we have him in our presence today. And, um, and, and we interrupted our chorus in preparation for singing Mary Mount by Howard Hansen to sing what we found out that evening to be one of David's favorite songs, um, Salvation is Created uh, by Cheshna. And um, we were practicing it earlier just as a break. And we then found out that we really would be like liking to sing it to David in his memory. Um, somebody at the last minute said, hey, wait, should we be recording this? And we just started singing right away. So um, I didn't realize my camera only took a minute and a half. <laughs> so you'll get the first minute and a half of this. I fortunately looked at it before the song was over and captured the last few minutes. So, so bear with me, or the last few 30 seconds. So bear with me here. This is Eastman Rochester Chorus singing Salvation is Created. Um, I apologize for the brief, abrupt of beginning, but. Part is for you. 
Thank you. The way that, that <coughs> when I came later in that day to visit with him, he played it for me. And uh, <laughs> had that same expression of joy on his face. We come today, friends, to pause for a moment in eternity. Give thanks for David S., a good man, a man who lived a full life, a well-lived life. I'm going to read the obituary that's printed in the bulletin and invite you to follow along. <coughs> I always knew David as David and never knew what the C stood for until I went to visit him in the hospital and they didn't have a David pass so they wouldn't let me see anybody else. <laughs> the Reverend Dr. Charles David Hess passed away March 7, 2014. After a few weeks hospitalization in the Wilmot Cancer Center, Strong Hospital Memorial Hospital, from lung cancer, his courage and faith inspired staff and visitors alike. Born May 31st, 1949, in Charleston, West Virginia, he was a graduate of Berea College, he received a Master of Divinity and a Doctor of Ministry from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. While in seminary, he pastored the Mount Hermon Baptist Church in Catawauk, Kentucky. Subsequently, he served the Glenwood Baptist Church in New Jersey, First Baptist Church in Hamilton, New York, and for 16 years, the West Henrietta Baptist Church in New York. The longest pastorate in this nearly 200-year-old congregation. Much loved and respected by his congregation and a wide circle of friends and acquaintances. He was active in the work of the American Baptist Churches in the Rochester, Tennessee region, and in many other local <coughs> statewide organizations, for instance, serving as chaplain of the West Henrietta Fire Department for several years. His love of music was widely recognized both within his congregation and also by his active role in the Eastman Rochester Chorus. <laughs> Preceded and dead by his mother, Val Hess, and niece, Jill Hess, he is survived by his father, Charles E. Hess, brother, Gary, married to Marcia, nephew, Chad Hess, Married to Tiffany, niece Jan Miller, married to Derek, great niece Lacey, great nephew Sawyer, Charlie, and Waylon, and his beloved dog Buster. Join with me in the invitation. <laughs> Out of your boundless love has come, O oh God, joy and peace and strength. We praise you for life abundant and eternal. We rejoice in having been brought closer to you by your spirit that is expressed in the life of our brother, David S. Help us to feel your presence in these moments of remembrance and worship. Please stand now and join with me singing Pray for the Lord the Christmas today is committed.
Here are these selections from the Old Testament. The first from the 139th Psalm, in which reference is made to the fact that God is the God of all seasons and all circumstances. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from you, in your spirit? Or where can I flee in from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and se settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And then these words from the 40th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded and disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Will you join with me in an ancient prayer familiar to most all of us, known as the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, assurances from the New Testament, beginning with 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Then to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that through, though perishable, is tested by fire, fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. 
for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus prepared his own disciples for his death. Give ear to his words. The Gospel of John, chapter 14. You're reading verses 1 through 3, 15 through 21, and 25 through 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. They who have, command, have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. I've said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. And finally, from John 3, 16 and 17. Interestingly, not the lectionary text for today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but the, that the world would be saved through him. May God's blessing be added to this holy word. Amen. Amen. I begin with remarks today with um, words that are shared from another friend of David, a leader in our denomination, our general secretary, A. Roy Bentley. I shared with him um, about David's death soon after he died, and I had forgotten that Roy had that connection with New Jersey, and Roy was executive minister there. And Jim and, and David's and Roy's lives intersected in a wonderful way. Hear his words. Dear friends, my heart grieves with yours today. I cannot think of David without remembering that his anim anim animated, keen wit and good nature. I love being with him in meetings because he could always make a deadly, dull agenda come alive with laughter. <laughs> and David was a great one for late night card games, which always caused me to wonder where a Baptist from West Virginia learned to play cards so well. <laughs> David was an outstanding pastor with a heart with room for all and a mind that was keen and insightful. David was courageous, and David was humble. These were gifts that enabled him to make even his death a moment of grace for the rest of us. I recall the many times David would put his hand on my sh shoulder 
and his West Virginia accent, I can't do it, but, but Roy, <laughs> Roy says, I'm sure God, no, I'm not sure that God speaks with a West Virginia accent, <laughs> but I rejoice with David that God's voice has called out to him. David, welcome home, son. Thanks be to God for the gift of resurrection through Christ our Lord. A favorite story of mine was one which was written by Dwight L. Moody, one of the nation's premier evangelists who ministered in the Chicago area in the late 19th century. Moody is reported to have told a group of his friends, some morning you'll read in the papers that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't believe a word of it. <laughs> At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1956. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit shall live forever. This is the spirit in which I approach this gathering to celebrate and honor our friend, our colleague, our pastor. I had a text from his brother Dave, uh, Gary, saying that he was with us in spirit today, so his um, brother, our brother and son, David Hess. David Hess is more fully alive today than the last time which any of us saw him, because he is alive in Christ Jesus, with whom he lived and with whom he died. David and I visited about three hours before he died on last Friday. And he told me three things during that visit. First thing he said, I thought I might die today. He said, I don't mind being alone because I never truly have been alone. And he said, I'm at peace. We prayed together with another good friend, Dick Myers. And David at the end gave me the thumbs up sign with a brief smile of joy on his face. It's that image that will be with me forever. The word which I associate and will forever associate with David is joy. It just lit up a room when he walked into it. And it immediately lifted the spirits of everyone in that room. He approached life with a generous optimism. One of the first tasks on my plate as an executive minister when coming to the region was having to fire David. It's not one that I look forward to at all. I arrived on the scene in 2002 and prior to my coming, the American Baptist churches reorganized and eliminated the funding for the position of world mission support which David held. He was our region staff person. He was paid by funds from this national, um, from the national denomination. And David was such a good match for this work. He loved mission work. He loved missions. He loved he was very supportive of missionaries. And his enthusiasm was just contagious with people. So I dreaded, I dreaded that inevitable conversation. And I arranged a meeting, and David, in his joyful manner, said to me, I know you have to fire me, and I want you to know I'm fine with that. But I'll do all I can to support you as you take on this work. I was the one who was a wreck about this. David accepted it with grace. Of course, he was around and kind of knew the writing on the wall. He had heard through the grapevine that this funding was going to be evaporating. But he just accepted the news with such grace. <laughs> just like he accepted the news a few weeks ago that he had stage four lung cancer. 
Bill Reynolds, an American Baptist colleague and a chaplain at Strong Hospital, told me that he never saw someone move so quickly from diagnosis to acceptance. They described for me the poor resident doctor who had been given the task of sharing the sad news with him. Strong is a teaching hospital. A very young resident doctor comes in sheepishly, and David says, I know. And this, you see the, uh, a sigh of relief on uh, this young doctor's face. <laughs> Probably the first time he had to do that with anyone. But relief that David just acknowledged what he was told. When visiting with David, I watched the staff at the hospital, even those who weren't assigned to him, would stop in to allow a little of his joyous optimism to brighten their dark, bitter cold days. That was the second cold <coughs> vortex we were experiencing. The other two things I would want to share about David is that he was always ahead of the curve when it came to technology and media. <laughs> you rarely could beat him to a first showing of a movie that when it was coming out. <laughs> and he was very invested in technology. He introduced the region to the World Wide Web. <laughs> he designed the region, uh, region's original website. And um, always, as always, there was a touch of the whimsical in David. So he included these cartoons that were on the website, and even a video cam of his bird feeder. <laughs> the second thing that I would want to share is about David is that he was one of the finest preachers I've ever heard. The West Henrietta Baptist folk here gathered um, wouldn't want to let this piece of information out for, you know, this, this bit of truth out for fear that some other church would snatch him away. <laughs> but David was an excellent preacher. He was current. He was insightful. He was challenging. He was passionate. And always joyful. I'm blessed to have known David these past 12 years. The region was blessed to have David's presence here for the last 16 years. He exemplified the best of what this region represents and his core values of respect and godly justice and reconciliation. He exemplified the best of what it means to be a Christian. Closing, I just would say thank you to the congregation here at West Henry Baptist Church for loving him and for letting him love you. Amen. Well, if we had time we could open up and hear a lot of stories. <laughs> As those of you who had an association with uh, David uh, recognized that he was, he was unique. And uh, it's such a temptation. I, I've known him for 28 years, but when he had moved away from New Jersey, we lost contact, but we restored that once we returned to Rochester. And uh, he knew when he'd get a, an invitation for lunch that uh, we weren't just looking after his bodily needs. Because when we were winding down the lunch, I would say, Oh, David, you know, while you're here, I wonder if you'd take a look at my computer. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't fooled. <laughs> but he still accepted my invitation. And our invitation and one of the great times was back in 2002. I had an opportunity to go to London for three weeks to cover for a British friend that I'd come to know in Italy earlier. And he was on many sabbaticals, so he asked if I would cover for him in uh, South Korea, just south of London. Well, we were excited about going, Flo and I, and, and then got to think, why not? Extended invitation, David. This would provide him for free overnight for 
the period of time that he could come. So he flew over separately and we met him and, and uh, he and I went into London a number of times by bus, which stopped right in front of the manse, and then picking up the train that would deposit us in the heart of London. And uh, he used to say, I could sniff out a McDonald's restaurant in London. I'd been there before, so I knew where some of them were. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, he had that opportunity and experience. But there are so many other stories, and I don't want to take them away from uh, uh, letting David speak for himself. Because you know, this service has been planned by David. The music, the, the fact that uh, his last sermon, which was preached right here in a chair in front of the communion table, with his oxygen tank, this was on the 16th of February, he, he um, chose as his title, Dealing with Uncertainty, and he spoke about being in that er period of uncertainty between getting some ominous warnings and then having conclusive evidence. And uh, it was a, a great gift to us. And in web his website for the church, uh, if you haven't visited that, I would suggest you do so. He, uh, he spoke about himself as a raging moderate. <laughs> now, how do you define that in terms of the political spectrum? <laughs> but that was David. He had the ability to, to, in a very succinct fashion, incorporate a great deal. There is another entry, and in fact, I, I, I read through some 22 messages that he sent out initially to individuals, but then he did it a more uh, productively and uh, uh, all-encompassing manner, and he would just press somehow, uh, uh, a number of us would get these messages, and I know David Eagles is here somewhere up there. Yeah, I know, I read about that comment that you offered to him too in response, and he picked that up because it was an element of humor that was mixed into the whole. There is one entry which was entitled, You Gotta Have Faith. And once he was attending a conference on evangelism in Washington, D.C., a new acquaintance asked him what he thought his gifts were. And this is what David wrote. After some hard thinking, I responded that I thought I had a gift in reaching secular persons and those with intellectual doubt about the truth of Christianity. I responded that to that because that was the case, because I have a great deal of skepticism in me. Faith has never been easy for me. Thus I can be sympathetic with others for whom Christian faith is not easy. But what is faith? Tony Campolo writes that when his son was a young boy, he wants to find faith as believing what you know isn't true. <laughs> now I can see how easy it is for many to arrive at that definition of faith. But faith for me has never been that. I would rather define faith as believing in that which I think really is true, though you cannot absolutely prove it. As long as human knowledge is partial, and I believe that will always be the case, at least on this side of death, faith is necessary for atheists as well as for Christians. I always have been struck by the words of Harry Emerson Fosdick. A man can put off making up his mind, but he can't put off making up his life. He was pointing out that the truth that we cannot refuse to live until all our questions, we, that we cannot refuse to live um, until all our questions are answered. Answers will come only by and through our living, and Christians believe at the end of our living. 
Paul was right. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, I, I, I've saved these uh, emails, and uh, looking through them uh, has been a gift that continues to give. Um, let me share a bit from the one that was written on the 28th of February. After telling of having settled most of his legal affairs, he chuckled about the young woman who called to inform him that uh, after he had canceled his contract with Delta Sonic, that if he chose to renew his contract, he would be paying more. <laughs> and then she asked, well, what, what, did, wasn't the service satisfying? <laughs> and he said something about, well, I'm entering hospice, and, and, and so I think that just passed right over her head. She came back and she said, well, if you change your mind, just let me know. <laughs> But that sense of humor was captured by Barbara Miller here, who sent a word to him, and she said, look, if things change up and, 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 and you do recover, these are my words, I'll be happy to pick up the difference. <laughs> this account prompted uh, uh, you know, he, he, he did, did use humor. Got away with an awful lot with the use of humor, but people understood it was not malicious, but it was a, just a spirit. Alan mentioned about uh, the hospital chaplain, Bill Reynolds, comment about David going through the five stages that uh, Elizabeth Keebler Ross speaks of in terms of the trans. The, the movement through the accept, through acceptance of death. But once when he was asked to uh, give a, a reason, perhaps how he had come to this measure of peace, he offered three uh, remarks, because and then he mentioned something about a three-point sermon. But he was going to resist that because the last sermon was the one that was preached on the 16th. He had these things to say. First, life is purely and simply a gift. We don't own it. We don't possess it. We did not call ourselves into existence. It is a gift. One day, we will have to relinquish it back to the one who gave it. The most important emotional response is that of gratitude. If this life is all there is, I would still be deeply grateful. It has been wonderful. I'm truly blessed. This allows me to approach my own life and death with a sense of lightness. And two, Christ is risen. I truly believe this. And three, I have not arrived at this belief easily. I am by nature a skeptic and de deep, feel deep kinship in, with Doubting Thomas and those from Missouri. <laughs> Anybody from Missouri? <laughs> The historical evidence convinces me that he is risen, but I'm convinced by more than that. One of my favorite scenes from the play Cotton Patch, Patch, Patch Gospel is when Jesus first appears to his disciples after his resurrection. He jumps into their midst with a big smile on his face and declares, it worked! <laughs> but you know, preachers don't stop with three points. He had it a fourth. <laughs> And he said, I'm convinced I'm surrounded by a cloud of witnesses on this side and on the next. Now, I could have gone on quoting other passages from David, but uh, I resisted because I knew that if I coupled that with remembrances and you also pitched in, we would not go home. And we might miss that little meal that's waiting for us back there. <laughs> I'm going to call on Alan Newton, a good friend, to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and wonderful God, we're thankful for the gift of faith which teaches us to face death, not as an end but as a new beginning. 
Therefore, we're thankful for the new beginning in David's life that began last Friday night. We rejoice that he is with you now. We are thankful for the delight and joy that is his and that he has brought to heaven. God, we weep, but may we in our sadness also find tears of happiness. We grieve our loss, but in our grief may we find relief that while David, with David there was discomfort, he was spared suffering. We're left with a measure of anxiety about the future for this church and life without David. But may that anxiousness be filled with hope and with possibilities of what you are already planning for this church and for us. Oh God, may we take into our hearts all the joy the wisdom that David imparted to us in all these years of association with him. Especially, may we develop the kind of relationship David had with you, O oh God, so that we may live with the same peace, the same assurance, the same trust, the same ability to to doubt and question and come out on the other side with greater faith. Finally, O oh God, we thank you for the gift David has been to us. We now return our gift back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 368. My hope is built. Please stand it as you're able. <laughs>
ask if you would, um, following the benediction, Beverly is going to play one of uh, David's favorites. Don't always believe what you see printed in the bulletin. <laughs> I spent a wonderful summer in 85 in Yorkshire, and I, that, I think in terms of Yorkshire, it's not Yorkshire, but it's New York Minster perception. <laughs> so I apologize for that here. But Gordon Young was an important uh, uh, composer, and David very much appreciated his music. So listen to this magnificent piece. Seated. And then uh, I think Beverly uh, is going to be continuing to uh, play some more Gordon Young music. And then we can move out into this room here where you can see a table with memorabilia about this former chaplain of the fire department and a lot of other pictures and so forth. And uh, then uh, there'll be some light refreshments there. But over in the firehouse, you know, this is great to have friends like the fire. <laughs> We're going to have some food over there. Casseroles have been brought by folks in the church, but the fire department has supplied some old pork and uh, chicken, and uh, just there'll be ta tables set in the two bays, so there'll be plenty of room for you all to come, and we'll continue on and share stories about David, because he was the one, and is the one, that put this all together with his suggestions and his life. Shall we pray? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forever. Amen. Amen.